funny. So what's going on, man? How are you? Um, I'm doing pretty well. Um, how, um, by the way, how do you want me to refer to you as? Do you want me to just, just say Sockdown or? Oh, you can call me Aiden, SDL, whatever you want. What's the old line? Anything but late for dinner. <laughs> <laughs> you said Aiden or Eden? Aiden, yeah. Aiden, okay, gotcha. Okay, cool, yeah. And you can just call me Nico. That that works. Um, yeah, man. So I, I wanted to chat with you because I've seen you on Destiny's and uh, Vosh's channel before, and I'm pretty active in both of those communities. Um, just some just some background inf info for you. I uh, started my channel in May. Um, so far, have like 140 subs and close to like 35 k views. So mm -hmm. doing really good with that. Um, I'm not really accustomed to like Twitch stuff, so I want to get more into that kind of stuff. But for now, I just like making like uh videos on YouTube. Mm -hmm. and for the time being, too, I've been like busy as hell with school. Um, so I've been like totally like bugged out with like doing videos every day. Um, have you but, finished finals or are you doing a winter uh courses or yeah, yeah, I finished finals um like a couple of days ago. Um, we didn't really like I know it varies from school to school, we didn't really have like final so to speak it was more of like you could have finished the final in like in like november if you wanted to so i was like pretty much done with my stuff um but yeah i, I was like busy with school and stuff and i'm just kind of like taking a, a chill pill obviously the election's over and stuff so i was pretty happy i don't have to like follow that every day um well i'm sure of course you're dutifully following the georgia runoff elections right and you are encouraging all of the people on your channel to register to get an absentee ballot before first january the last day to register to get an absentee ballot for the georgia runoffs that was right? a very that was a ve yeah that was a very good plugin that yeah 100 <laughs> percent. you're you're not going to hear any uh any ml ml takes from me about not voting or participating in an electoralism well after um, all you are a rad lib right <laughs> I am I am a rad lib, yes. No, I would say I would say like so sock them, but mm -hmm. um, what was I gonna say? Oh yeah, so funny meme. Uh, so in 2016, uh, by the way, I'm 20, right? So in okay. 2016, I was uh, <laughs> I was a big Trump supporter in 2016, right? Oh and no, I, <laughs> I was 16 years old. So so bear in mind. Mm -hmm. But um, I kind of made my way um from from that point over to where I am now, and that's obviously taken years. Um, but it was funny, actually, that I saw you did a, or did you do it, or did you help set it up, like an AMA with Chomsky? Uh, it's a little complicated. I, I helped run it, but I didn't set it up. No, that's, um, their, their name is, on Discord, is Lincoln, but it's okay. in Lincoln and Shiny. Oh, uh, that was, that was pretty fucking cool, because um, immediately after, like, I was, like, flirting with, like, the conservative bullshit in 2016, mm -hmm. I started, I started, like, reading uh, into, like, leftist theory, and obviously the first person I saw was Chomsky. Um, so long story short, in 2018, I went to a liberal arts school like south of Minneapolis to go see Chomsky give a speech about climate change and foreign affairs uh, policy stuff. So Chomsky's, um, Chomsky's a national treasure, man. I love that guy. Like he's, um, I credit a lot of my political 180 to him and obviously other people as well. But mm -hmm. I, um, Chomsky's like a really awesome guy. And I couldn't help, but um, like I, I did you see the um? I'm sure the uh, Virgil and Brianna Joy Gray interview that that they did with Chomsky. I never watched the full thing, uh, but I did see the the few clips that came out of it where Chomsky was, to my opinion, basically just objectively correct, and they just kind of pivoted away. Yeah, yeah, a hundred percent. Yeah, that that kind of boiled my blood because like you're literally talking to like Noam Chomsky, one of the world's like renowned like linguists, political theorists um and like their whole rebuttal was like yeah but biden and trump both bad <laughs> and i'm sure you, i'm sure you've seen that memes but there was like one meme where it was like chomsky with a gun and it's like do you want your fucking grandchildren to survive <laughs> no i mean that's literally um so the, the, the way i opened the ama I, I guess we're just doing so um before we get too far into this i know we haven't done it formally um i should encourage you uh so that i can start like the vod or something here um and I'll, I'll do this maybe th two, two more times. Uh, just tell us who you are, what you do, and where people can find you, just for people who are watching. So yeah, I posted your links in chat. But Yeah, for sure. Uh, my name is Nico Sam. Mm -hmm. I make uh, videos on YouTube, political content. Excellent. Um, and yeah, I'm 20 years old. I'm still in school. Uh, I like to play video games. I like to cover politics. And uh, yeah, uh, hopefully going forward, I can find some more people to debate and um, right-wing nonsense to debunk.
And you can find them on YouTube and Twitter. Um, as, as search Nico Sam. Uh, and I posted Thanks. links in chat, of course. Um, so uh, to, to return to it, sorry, I just I got to make sure you get your shell, your shill in. Yeah, um, yeah, no worries. <laughs> it's my duty, right? My, um, the, I opened the thing with Chomsky asking, like, what should we do as leftists to ensure like a socialist future? And his answer was literally, first, we must survive. It was literally the first thing he said in that conversation. So I was very struck by that. I never, yeah. um, I never had the, the, the move from the right to the left. I, I've always been on the left, so I don't have that experience. Um, a lot of people seem to share your re reverence for Chomsky. So I was very happy to do that AMA. Um, that's awesome. Yeah, no, that's that's really like, it's funny too, because literally anyone, because I, I remember, I think it was when I was a sophomore or junior. So that was like after kind of like my freshman year where I was like done with all the Trump shit. Because, mm -hmm. um, you know, being like a teenager in high school, you're kind of like an edgelord. Um, not everyone, but most kids like fall down this like pipeline where, you know, you and your friends are like, oh, dude, it's it's fun to like make fun of transgender people and mm -hmm. gay people. And it's like it's like, OK, like at some point I kind of like matured past that point. And I also was like, wait, like, what the fuck do I actually believe? Like, do I, do I actually think that like tax cuts for the wealthy are good or do I think like um, deregulation is good? Like things like that. And so, then you became a radical liberal. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Actually, funny enough, I I have considered myself like a social democrat ever since then, but mm -hmm. it wasn't it wasn't only until like it wasn't only until like um what's it called um like I would say this year maybe or like last year where I, I got into like a lot of like uh leftist like socialist stuff and I started reading actually like Marx um or like Kropotkin or even like some of Chomsky's books about like anarchism and stuff. Mm -hmm. um and i obviously like vosh is content and i like your content too um but i don't know i still like i still would consider myself pretty social democratic or like and mm -hmm. that's kind of what i want to discuss with you about because i feel like in terms of like the online left i feel like honestly up, and this is i'm not trying to like Hello? um uh -oh. stuff, i'm not trying to like suck your dick here but you know like i i give you i give you praise because i feel like you and vosh are the only people that are uh -oh. able to like um that are able to like actually like talk about like okay these are the policies i'm in favor of this is how we get to this point like we can look at this we can look at that um i feel like other people are just like really irrational with this shit like i'm sure you've seen destiny's debates with like with like mike from pa or like the other guy the um the guy from vietnam that lives in vietnam like some of those dudes mm -hmm. are just way fucking out there and like the strategy for them is like well dur 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 capitalism bad socialism now like okay well that's what not well, I guess one of the things that's very interesting to me is um, this is something that's been on my mind a little bit recently because um, one of the first like prepared videos I made is is like socialism explained. And so one of the things that I found a lot of explanations from people who talk about socialism, like the examples you're talking about, is they don't present a positive vision of socialism. They don't say, hey, socialism is when workers own the means of production. Here's how. It's socialism is when we democratically plan production. Here's how. And socialism is when we compress everyone together such that there are no longer classes. And here's how. Instead, it's usually presented as the rejection of capitalism. Famously, people will describe communism as like stateless, moneyless, and classless. That doesn't actually tell you what it is. Um, those are all negations. Um, and I, so I, that frustrated me. That's been something that's been on my mind. So I've been very happy to see people talking more about that. I guess I'm not so sure. I, I'm, not, I'm not trying to cast shade on Vosh. I just don't watch Vosh really um, mm -hmm. uh, enough to, to, to make an opinion on that. Um, maybe he does what I do. So thumbs up to that. Um, but totally yeah. he could be correct there. And then two, I guess the, the thing that's very interesting to me, just to touch on what you're talking about with like uh, Mike from PA and um, I believe you're talking about non-compete. Uh, yeah, who's yeah, from, yeah, yeah. Mm -hmm. um, a lot of them, it's just, I, I, so I've, I've almost become anti-theory. So theory in leftist circles means like read book, basically read old book. Um, and um, my, one of my, the ways that I think about this is Oh, there's this really neat anecdote, and um, sad, sad to say, I did actually get it from a website called Social Democracy for the 21st Century, so I guess this is proof that I'm a lib. But um, <laughs> there was this really neat anecdote of like um, how when you live in history can bias you, and I think it's interesting as a general principle and also specifically for like economic philosophy. So there's this thing called what called the Angles Pause, and this author called Robert C. Allen, who's like a, they're they're like a proper leftist. Um, they're like either a sock dem or a, like left of that. Um, they wrote they wrote a whole book, um, basically explaining an argument for successes of like USSR economic growth and so on. So they are by no means like uh, enamored with capitalism, but 
they push this graph, um, which they call the, the angles pause. And um, I, I know I'm getting really into the weeds here. I've, I'll pull it back in like 15 seconds, I promise. Yeah, no worries. In, in short, when Engels and Marx were writing the early stuff in like the 1840s and 50s, they had the perception of history where real wages hadn't risen for about a century or so. And so from their perspective, it was genuinely true that real wages weren't rising. But in the long run, they did start to rise for the reasons that he explains in this article. And so you can see around 1840 or so, wages started to rise and rise and rise and rise. And they really fundamentally haven't stopped since. Um, and so you'll find in a lot of early Marxian texts and even in people like Luxembourg, who wrote in like the 1899, that wages weren't rising. And it all comes from, to my view, uh, 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 a blind spot, literally, like a, an inability to see the future in, in history. You shouldn't. Basically, they, they couldn't have known what came afterwards, and so they made a, a hazy generalization. And so I think the same thing occurs with a lot of theory books about how to achieve communism. It's like, hey, we did a revolution in Russia, therefore it applies everywhere in all times, in like to the entirety of the future, to the entirety of the world. You, you're drawing from a small sample size and then concluding everything. Um, so I know that was a long one, but I will let you... <laughs> I'm sorry. No, actually, I'm really glad you went over the um, the angles pause thing, because I've seen you post that on your Twitter before when you're arguing mm -hmm. with like with like hammer and sickle uh, hammer and sickle emoji um mm -hmm. twitter users which is which is funny because uh, they shit on you all the time <laughs> even though you are yourself a socialist um but they just don't like you because i guess you uh participate in electoralism then um but anyways um no that's actually like a really good point because when i so <laughs> i'll be up front like i try mm -hmm. to read i try to read capital um it was so fucking boring i couldn't do it it's i <laughs> It's Ooh. dense, man. Yeah, I, I, I couldn't do it. Like, all my information that I got about Marxism um, was basically either through, like, YouTube or Wikipedia or even, like, Marxism.org or is it .com, whichever one it is. Mm -hmm. um, it took me a while, actually, to understand as well how, like, socialism or communism would operate. Like, I always thought, even when I was, like, I would say I was pretty well informed in high school, like, after my, my um, Trump days, like, when I was actually, like, a sock them and I was, like, a liberal or whatever, like, I actually thought, um, or I thought I, I knew what socialism and communism were, um, but I was I would always make the mistake of being like, oh, like actually, like socialism is when like the means of production are in the hands of like the government or whatever. That's just not true. Mm -hmm. um, I feel like in order to have like these good faith conversations, like especially with like conservatives or even like liberals too, like you need to at least understand what socialism is because I feel like when people understand what it actually is, they're more if they're not like sympathetic to it, at least they understand and they're not straw manning you, right? And you're like, oh. Vuvuzela iPhone 101 blah 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 like that's that's kind mm -hmm. of like the point but um well that's, I, uh, sorry oh, no, go ahead no, no, I go was ahead. just I was just going to agree I think that um it's it's really bad in terms of a praxis level to encourage people who are like hey I'm new to socialism what should I do oh you should read this like 2000 book page book um by Karl Marx which is very very dense and somewhat poorly written and not as like a necessarily like a critique of it it's just long and dense and it does it's not like very clear in its language um like literally my suggestion would be if you're going to do that literally just tell them to f find a good Karl Marx reader that's 90 pages long and have it do the exact same job as 2000 pages um yeah I, and there's I, a, there's a lot of work too like i mean i've so i've read like the gotha program mm -hmm. um i i read i read luxembourg's um reformer revolution and the accumulation mm -hmm. of capital um these are all like pretty good books but it's just like at the end of the day like theory is just that like it's theory like the actual impl implementation of these things are a lot more complicated than it seems like on paper. Um, and that's what I feel like sometimes too, like, and, and here's the funny part. Okay. Too, because like with this, with this, um, th this like force the vote on Medicare for all shit that like people like Jimmy Dore and Kyle Kalinske are pushing. Mm -hmm. It's just so like, um, so out of left field, like at a time, especially when like we literally have to fight for, for scraps to get like $600 stimulus checks. Like, Forcing a vote on Medicare for all right now is like probably the most idiotic thing ever, um, in my opinion. Like, I just don't think that's a even if like you support Medicare for all, like I don't just I don't think that's a good strategy. And I think a lot of people on the left too fail to recognize that like at the end of the day, like you might be correct on the policy, but if you don't have the correct strategy, um, you might you're like you're probably not gonna be able to get shit done. Like that's a big well aspect. And that's again, again, this is one of those areas where I feel like socialist praxis is often defined by what it's not rather than what it is. So you'll have people saying, hey, we want to do the revolution, which again, I think is based on a more or less a hasty generalization. It worked in like the 1900s when states were weak, when people were poor, when people were close to starvation, and one economic crisis could take half the country and put them at risk of literally dying. 
Um, and we just, we don't live in the world of like weak states and like close to starvation um, today. We just don't. Um, which is why we've seen a decline of the rate of revolution, which is why we've never seen a successful socialist revolution in any liberal democracy, not one. Um, it, it's, it's, so to me, it, it's, it's this hasty generalization and it's defining socialist like activism as revolutionary and like this workers movement, but not as defining like what effective praxis actually is. Um, because th there's, there's literally whole studies in like sociology about how to achieve social change. And instead of reading that and trying to find out what's effective as a movement, it's, hey, read Lenin. Lenin says revolution. So we're going to do a revolution. Anything other than a revolution doesn't count. So um, you get this kind of all or nothing approach to praxis, which I think is very frustrating. Um, yeah it's just um it's just i feel like too like some of these issues are so like reduced down um like a lot of these issues especially like um the way like our system works in this country uh it's just it's so complicated like to reduce it down to like okay like the worker like a party of the vanguard or like mm -hmm. the dictatorship of the proletariat like taking over like that seems all fine and dandy but it's like okay what's the actual implementation and how would we get to that point and then a lot of people um, which don't have answers for that will be like, well, uh, in order for that to happen, these conditions need to happen. So, yeah. And then ideally, like, that's obviously not going to happen. Like, ideally, that could be possible. But realistically, mm -hmm. is that going to happen now? Like, probably not. Um, so what can, we, what can we be focusing on in the short term to get, like, I don't know, like things like healthcare passed, maybe like uh, a $15 minimum wage? Uh, action on like climate change stuff like that and that's mm -hmm. part of the argument too that chomsky was making um was like yeah it's, it's pull, culture, pull the on. fucking lever pull the fucking yeah. lever get someone who's five percent better or something and then go do what you think the actually important activism is basically yeah a hundred percent a hundred percent like <laughs> what there's a meme there's a meme with that where it's like with brianna joy gray and chomsky and and he's like just pull the fucking lever yeah it's like it's like that's a hundred percent accurate because like I, I don't know, like if Trump actually ended up winning, this country I, I like I still think this country's kind of fucked because like obviously Republicans pro I think I don't know. I don't know what your opinion is on this, but I think Warnock will probably win, but Ossoff might lose. Hard to know. Um like yeah, I think if I, we I took know. the if we took the current polls and we said they were as wrong as in the Trump uh, the the, the twenty sixth sorry. The previous general election then i think that right now warnock would win and Asaf would lose but these are like razor thin like 0 0.5 0 0.1 margin sort of things so it's really yeah. hard to know i'm like i'm like crossing my fingers because like if that like if they both win that's obviously great mm -hmm. um, but i'm like i'm hoping for the best expecting the worst so like even at that like if if one of them loses right then we have still a republican majority um it'll be pretty hard to get past through like even like a public option or like any, any like any minor like legislation right like even like an increase in the minimum wage or something um it'll be very hard to do any of that so that, that that's to me what the biggest thing i've worried about like if trump wins like we're fucked well no that's that's again this is the way that i think about it it's it's that i think that um this is this is a really interesting point that actually i think want to say either philosophy to no it was um what's their face there, there's a guy who did a series on like tactics of the alt right. Do you know who I'm talking about? Oh my god! Fair, Fair Day speaks. N no, 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 no. It's um, it's like a drawn series. Um, oh, oh. Alt right tactics series. I'm sorry. Oh. <laughs> I just wanted to to find the guy because I really like to shout him out. Yeah, no, it's Innuendo Studios. Um, oh yeah, 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 yeah. Innuendo Studios. Yep. They had this one video where they commented on the fact that people who oppose voting um, for the lesser evil often have this deontic approach. And so like in, in very crass terms, deontology is when you say an action is moral or immoral, if it fits some like general set of rules, utilitarianism or consequentialism more generally is something is good if it promotes good consequences, um, or at least better consequences. And so a lot of times it's very interesting. Uh, we, we have no empirically from research. Conservatives are much more likely to think deontologically and liberals and leftists are much more likely to think utilitarian consequentially and so it's very odd voting is one of the few things that some people particularly those on the left think deontologically it's i don't want to vote for the bad one i need to vote for the the, the the right one i need to vote for the socialist instead of thinking about things in like a consequentialist worldview which is like hey we need to reduce harm um, because there's no other reasonable option so i just thought that was a very interesting analysis i can go find that video but um, they have a whole really good series on the alt-right um yeah, yeah, I don't disagree. I also think part of like the the Republican or part of the conservative like 
I would say base or I, I mean, obviously the the leadership is all ghouls, but a lot mm-hmm. of the even the conservative base, like a lot of people are just straight up like anti intellectuals, and like I don't mean yeah. that I don't mean that with scorn. Like I just genuinely, um, I mean that like from a place of like compassion because I genuinely feel bad for some of these people that have been indoctrinated into like these right wing circles, um, and they're being fed like pseudoscience, whether it be like phrenology if you're on the far far right Mm -hmm. or even like things like climate change climate change denial which actually i think go hand in hand with things like phrenology like if you believe that like skull shapes and skull sizes impacts like iq like there's definitely you definitely also believe that like climate change is fake or whatever like those two things are probably directly correlated well so something that um so i totally agree with all of this um however i do think so I did want to, to pivot a little bit. So we, mm-hmm. we spent all this time dunking on conservatives, okay? And uh, they're, yeah. they're stupid. And we've dunked on anti people who don't want to participate in the electoral system to try and mitigate harm, okay? So we, we, we've achieved true centrism. Um, but within that centrism, uh, we need to infight, okay? So I believe, originally, you had wanted to talk a little bit about socialism. Yeah. Uh, and so to me, um, it, you, you described this, this like, journey of moving, moving left. So I guess uh, the, the question that I sometimes ask is like, what moved you to where you are left today? And what is keeping you there from moving further left, if that is the trend? So I think for the first question, what moved me, what moved me left in the first place was mm-hmm. like, as I said, um, I was like a pretty big Trump supporter, albeit like, I think more or less back then when I was like a conservative, quote unquote, or Trump supporter, mm-hmm. I was 16. So I wasn't really that, that, um, that were like well read up on like political issues. And I thought like, (laughs) I had like very, very like outlandish like beliefs like, oh, um, you know, actually um, fuck Obama. We need to like repeal Obamacare and then like open it up to like the states or whatever that Mm -hmm. Trump plan, like just stupid shit like that. It wasn't really, it wasn't really anything more than kind of like a bandwagon effect um, because I saw a lot of my friends too in high school were like big Trumpers. Um, So like that was one part of it. Um, also too, like, I feel like <laughs> it's funny cause people always talk about like the YouTube, um, pipeline to like the alt, right. Mm-hmm. There's also, there's also actually conversely, even at that time, there's also conversely like a the reverse. Uh, a pipe- yeah. Reverse. Um, I don't think at first I found like, I think more recently or like maybe in the last couple of years, I found people like, um, Contra oh. and people like H bomber guy and people like philosophy tube, even if I disagree with some other takes more or less more with like philosophy tube and H bomber guy. But, um, I think the first person I actually started watching was believe it or not, um, secular talk, which is mm-hmm. pretty funny because I don't, I don't watch him at all nowadays. <laughs> um, after, after the whole shit where he went on Joe Rogan and he's like, Oh, I didn't vote for Biden because, uh, he voted for the Iraq war or whatever. I was like, okay, dude, like, come mm-hmm. out. But even before then, I kind of like outgrew secular talk. Like I've I've been watching Destiny since like 2018. Oh, <laughs> like the uh, the Lauren Southern. Not just debate. a radical liberal, but a neoliberal, an omni liberal. <laughs> yeah, exactly. And funny enough, actually, Hassan actually um, timed me out from his chat because he was saying something about Destiny. And I said, "Why are you always calling him a neolib?" And he got mad at me. So that was that was funny. But I watch Hassan so- too. I like Hassan. No, so I, it it sounds to me a bit like you're changing the content, and then you're also changing the sorry that you're changing the content you watch, and you're also changing the content of your beliefs, like as correspondingly. So it's yeah, like I think I think the 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 180 I had was was really like primarily based on like the content I was watching, but also mm-hmm. doing like doing like independent like thinking on my own and like research and stuff. Um, like I remember like the first thing I was like, okay, like maybe I should get like a basic definition of like terms and stuff. And then maybe go into more of like the philosophical, like understanding or like ideological, like standing. And then when I was like, oh, like, fuck this. Like, I'm not a conservative. Like, mm-hmm. like I'm not like, I, I don't believe in any of this shit. Like I wasn't even, I wasn't ever really like religious, religious either. Um, and fuck, like, I hate like r slash atheism, like weebs. Like I don't. <laughs> I, I guess I would consider myself like an atheist or agnostic, but like some of the like the atheism people are really mm-hmm. like are like so so atheist that they'll like shit on like religion too much. Maybe I don't know if that's if that's if that's a good or a bad thing. But like I think I think you know what I'm who I'm referring to, like Sam Harris and like Richard Dawkins and all those weirdos. Like 
Well, I totally get that. I think that people often have this perspective of the people that move them left or the people that change their mind on something. Eventually, then they, they form a, a more like coherent worldview. And sometimes the people who are like the, the, the biggest spoken, the, the biggest audience people for mm -hmm. that worldview are actually not very good at expressing that always. Um, yeah. So like secular talk, maybe Richard, definitely Richard Dawkins is not a, he has like a whole enormous skeleton full of closets like a walk-in skeleton of closet of, of skill sorry a walk-in closet of skeletons um right. but so i guess i i am totally glad to see like the the i guess the centrist to leftist pipeline working in action okay uh, squeaky clean people just being pumped through over to a socialist land uh, mm -hmm. if i had it so on like a that's that's the that's like the description of your journey. If you had to talk about like what beliefs you hold that would need to change, I guess, to move to the left, what would those beliefs be? Um, probably on I would say probably on like the efficacy or like um, success of like actually transitioning to like a socialist economy, um, because that would obviously take like transforming like our system from from top to bottom mm -hmm. so that's like one thing I, th I think for me it's more of like a practical lens like i don't think i would necessarily be opposed um to because like i said like I've, I've read marx i've read luxembourg like mm -hmm. i'm very i'm very familiar with like socialism and communism now actually a lot more um a lot more than when i was like 18 and i thought like oh socialism is when the government does stuff like mm -hmm. um, <laughs> But, but even then I was like arguing from like a social democratic point all the time. Like I was like, no, like I want to be like Sweden or I want to be like Germany because mm -hmm. I also I also come from and I mentioned this. I don't know if I mentioned this to you, but I thought I thought you were Canadian for some reason. Um, <laughs> <laughs> so I'm I'm a I'm a Canadian citizen because my mom was born in Canada. But mm -hmm. I live in I live in Chicago and um, my both my parents are actually from Greece cool um, so i've been to europe a lot i've like got to experience with europe and i've got to experience with canada um so i've seen how like these different systems work and i know like for a fact like the system we have here in the u.s is so dead broke fucked. yeah oh like i think i was in dgg chat yesterday i was talking to somebody from new zealand but i was telling them like yeah like we don't have like paid sick time off or like paid vacation time off and they're like oh what the fuck and i'm like mm -hmm. I'm like, and I'm like, yeah, we don't have that. And they're like, and this guy's like, oh, well, my dad just, my dad has um 50 vacation days that he can take off for. And I'm just like, yep, I've, I like, I, I would assume so, right? Like if you're in New Zealand or like some other country like that. Not in um, the USA. No, not in the USA. Yeah. So I guess, yeah, I well, guess my, well, no, go ahead. Sorry. No, so I just to just to, I, I totally like get that perspective of like the the sock dem um, perspective, and I think it is easier. I think that one of the things that it, my part of my experience of moving to left like sock dem, I will totally relate to was just like opening up to um, systems outside of the United States, kind of like leaving American exceptionalism or whatever. So I totally relate to that. Um, I guess to to directly answer the the original point. Um, I think that the the question of like transition from like a social democracy to a social system is really really interesting. Um, <laughs> one moment, sorry. Yeah, no worries. I guess the Discord uh, camera froze. Oh well, I just couldn't tell if our internet was cutting out. Um, no, I still I still see I still see you moving on my end. Oh no, actually the stream is good again. Okay, so the. I think that there, there's some really interesting examples. So I, I'm a reformist. I, I don't want a revolution. Um, so my answer would be very different from if you talked to other lefties. My answer is to give you concrete examples like the Meidner plan or stuff like like Corbyn's plan or e like even people like Richard Wolff. Um, and so all of them have this uh, approach where they don't want to do things all at once. They want to do things slowly over time. So Meidner plan, I think, is one of the simplest ones. It's um, take every country that has, I'm sorry, every company that has over, let's say, uh, 500 employees. And I can provide you a Jacobin link about the Meidner plan. Um, yeah, yeah. And require that they have a union. Um, and then over 50 years, um, require that company to transfer stock ownership, 1% of a stock ownership each year to said union. And so in come 50 years, de facto, unions will own the vast majority of stocks in the country. Um, this is similar to other sorts of policies where you might imagine like a worker co-op policy where every year a certain number of firms have to transition to a worker cooperative or you like slowly expand unions and then you expand the power of unions via something like co-determination in Germany until eventually they are at a starting point where they can already become cooperatives. Um, 
a similar like related proposal um, is uh, the social wealth fund proposal. So uh, uh, what's his face? Matt Brunig. Oh yeah, I'm familiar with Matt Brunig. Uh, Matt Brunig's uh, social wealth fund proposal. Um, I don't know the specific details of his. I can't fairly say. Um, however, the general idea is something relatively similar again. It's that the, the state keeps paying into this big wealth fund, so it just accumulates and accumulates and accumulates wealth. And using that wealth, it buys up more and more of the of the country, literally buying stocks in firms. And eventually, the government becomes the biggest owner of firms in the country. And so, um, obviously, that's just the government does stuff or unions does do stuff. This is not sufficient to get socialism. I guess I'm just yeah. trying to give the broad strokes of these are the types of policies that people talk about. It's transferring ownership over time from private to public hands, either unions or cooperatives or like the state. Um, those would be the, the examples I'd point to. Yeah. Um... Let's see. So I wrote that down. So I think um, I think I've seen. I don't know if how what like plethora of data I've seen, but I think so far the data I've seen regarding worker cooperatives seems mm -hmm. to be very good. Um, and if worker cooperatives are effective and they do result in like workers um, being much happier, um, being more productive, things like that, then of course, like I'd be all in for for things like worker co-ops. Um, I think I, th I heard you bring up Germany and I, I think I'm familiar because I've seen Richard Wolf talk about that too. Where like in Germany, mm -hmm. labor has like 20, it has like a, um, like a, uh, a fourth position on the board, I think. Right. Is that it the depends right? on the size of the firm. I, I want to say, um, I think you can just look it up on Wikipedia, but spitballing, yeah. I want to say it's like any firm over 250 employees. It's like labor gets a third of the seats and at over like a thousand, it gets 50%, something along those lines. But yeah. I could be, yeah. I could be wrong. Yeah, so that's not that's not either a bad idea. That's pretty good actually, I would say. Um also too, funny you brought up the um the thing about unions too, because unions in this country have been fucking obliterated for like the sure. last fifty years. I think our rates of unionization are like one of the lowest, I guess, in the OECD countries. I think we're like seven percent, which is really bad. Um so yeah, unions have been completely like fucking ob <laughs> obliterated, but um, there's on that note, um, there was a really interesting argument by, um, I want to say it's again Matt Brunig, or I think it's another person, if you want another person who's left wing, not necessarily a socialist, but left wing, I, um, is Gabriel Zuckman. Um, do you know like Thomas Piketty, like the, the capital in the 21st century, somewhat famous French yeah. economist? Um, he's, yeah. I, he's one of his co-workers, um, and so I guess he gets some of that reflected fame, I suppose. Um, yeah. And he publishes a lot about wealth and wealth taxes. Um, and yeah. What was it exactly? Oh, I just wanted to know. I think one of his arguments was that um, in the United States, bargaining is very different than it is in most other countries. And um, I know where to find this. Econ FIP. Um, I think. No, it was Dube. My bad. Dube is another one of their coworkers. There was this really neat graph that um, drew my attention because, and I posted it in, in DMs. Uh, I think it's really neat. So. There's two metrics of what unionization means. One is membership and one is coverage, which might sound odd because you're like, what does it mean to be covered by a union? In the United right. States, the vast majority of unions are firm level. If you're in that firm, you're covered by the union. If you're not in that firm, you're not covered by the union. That's not the case in most other countries. Um, so in every country north of, of Canada, right, Germany all the way through France, the vast majority of union coverage is outside of that individual union. You aren't necessarily a member, you're just covered by collective bargaining agreements. And so right. one of the interesting proposals they suggest is um, policymakers should encourage collective bargaining so that people don't need to be part of a union for that sector to be unionized. It should be possible for entire sectors to unionize akin to Sweden or literally virtually every other country on this list um, without requiring that each firm be unionized in particular. Um, and so as, as a success story, but also like a, not a success story, they point to France, which is at the very top for coverage. It's like 98% coverage, way at the top, but only has 8% union membership, literally identical to the United States. So in membership, it's, a, it's atrocity. It's terrible. But in coverage, it's a success story. I think the strongest model is, is probably that of Sweden, Denmark, um, and uh, Norway, which have high membership and high coverage, which should make it more durable. But um, all this is to say, one of the interesting suggestions is the decline of unions. One of the ways to bring them back is sectoral bargaining. So, that. are you um, are you familiar with the um, Supreme Court case that happened in 2017, um, Janus versus uh, I think it was. It was for, it's from my state, but I forget mm -hmm. who, but it was, it was the Janus case. Are you familiar with that? Um, Janus AFCME? 
I think so. Yeah, I, I think that what it was it was about this guy who didn't want to pay union dues because mm -hmm. he didn't like um, the political affiliation of the union, um, and that essentially was kind of like a cover, just kind of like a way to like to break up unions, obviously. Um, that, but there's been a lot of like um, there's been a lot of that that's happened regarding like court cases and stuff in the past decades, um, especially now too. I wonder with with like a six three court. If they're gonna lean more into that or things like environmental regulations or stuff like that which is really important mm -hmm. but you actually do bring up a good point because this is something um this is something that like i i think i want to say my one of my cousins in canada um they're not in, in they're not like really in a union but they're like they're affected by like cba bargaining mm -hmm. by um by bargaining agreements um so essentially, like they they also like you said, even if they're not covered, uh, even if they're not in a in the membership of the union, they're still covered. Um, but that's insane how low it is in the U.S. Like it's not alone that like our membership rate is low; it's that our also like our coverage rate is pretty low. Yeah, um, and it, it's fundamentally it's the same model. Um, just restarting my camera. That like the, the United like, Kingdom, Japan, and Canada, like to some degree, Canada is better than the others, but. Um, it's basically what's called like the 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 English model of like unionization um, and and bargaining. Japan has it, South Korea has it, um, United States has it, and Canada to some degree has it. Canada is somewhat of an in betweener. Um, yeah. So I feel like um, I was gonna ask you. I was like, I was gonna ask you a silly, just a meme question. But can you explain what labor vo labor vouchers um, are and how would they function in like a socialist uh, economy? So I have, I'll, I will answer your question uh, twofold. Um, one is that personally, I've leaned away from using terms like labor voucher or another distinction. Sometimes you'll hear people talking about as personal versus private property. I've leaned right. away from those because I find that those arguments are very semantic. Um, and so instead of talking about like, hey, here's the, the mechanisms of how labor vouchers are different. Hey, here is the mechanisms of how property ownership is different under socialism. It's just, well, we've defined a category of property and a non-category of property. And we've defined like a new form of money. And it's just not money anymore. Uh, right. The answer that I would give for what they, the, the goal that people are trying to achieve with labor vouchers, um, to steel man it, I guess. The goal is to reduce accumulation of money, to reduce the, the, the um, hoarding of wealth is the basic goal. I don't necessarily think that labor vouchers are actually a good way to achieve that. I think that a lot, there's a lot of evidence that ta literally just having regular money, but taxation seems to better achieve that goal. The basic idea is um, let's say that you're a worker, you're of like able body and mind, you go to work, you work eight hours, you get a labor voucher for your eight hours. Depending on the socialist, they'll either tell you that you get a labor, vo labor voucher literally worth $8, like you get eight one hour labor vouchers, um, or I guess eight times 60 minute or whatever, you know the point. Um, right. Or some of them will allow for pay scales. And so they'll say, well, you'll get labor voucher, labor hours times your productivity or something. So depending on the socialists, they'll tell you that. So you take them and you could hold them in your apartment, I suppose. Um, but the, the the theory of labor vouchers is supposed to be that they have a time limit um, and they have a consumption limit so that if you don't spend them, they just get destroyed. And um, if you um, do spend them, then they also get destroyed. So that's the whole magic of it. So you have to go and spend these labor vouchers at like your local, I guess, cooperative bread store, and they give you eight hours worth of bread back. Um, or like after three months or something, the labor vouchers are just gone and dead. So the basic goal that, that I think the steel man of labor vouchers is really about wealth and capital accumulation. They don't want any individual to be able to accumulate so much wealth, so much capital that they could become a new, new bourgeoisie. Again, I don't think this is a great way to go about it, but I think that's the goal of labor vouchers, what they're really trying to do. Okay, that makes that makes sense because um, from what I understood it, um, it was kind of like, how do I want to put like the way I understood it was that like a labor voucher is kind of like, um, fuck, hold on, I had the sorry, I had the definition. Oh God, right, wait. I was looking at no worries about it. Um, it was like, oh yeah, it was essentially like. Um, Sorry, hold on. These, these some of these terms are so confusing that my brain gets like warped up with like mixing them up. So sure. Um, is a uh, okay. Yeah. So basically, you were saying that like it was so that we don't create a new class of like bourgeoisie, mm -hmm. uh, and that essentially, um, also it would include like oh demand for goods, right? Too, right? Um, I mean, I think so. Right. It would. Yeah. That's that's what I was getting mixed mixed up on about. Okay. Um. Yeah, no, I um, 
there's a lot of interesting stuff and also i wanted to quickly like um reverberate back to one point you made earlier about mm-hmm. how like marx and angles like in theory like didn't see what capitalism was coming to or like what would happen mm-hmm. in the next hundred years or even mm-hmm. beyond that um that's actually like a really good point because even when i was like reading marx um and when he's talking about like you know capitalism will collapse under its own weight and stuff like that um i don't think he realized that going forward we would have things like social democracies or like a welfare state which would even if capitalism collapses like it did in 2008 well guess what we have like in the states we have the federal reserve um we have stuff like that like i don't think he ever really saw any of that coming i guess i don't know about the social democracy i do know that um that it is a broadly true generalization that wages like market wages not um not like post tax and transfer um income but pre tax and transfer market income um does generally follow with productivity to some degree within some variation um Mm -hmm. and um so I, I think that one of the things, if you read like the Robert Allen paper, basically it argues that after a certain level of technological development was reached, um, the labor supply got sufficiently scarce that employers had to bargain over workers and workers were sufficiently valuable to them that they needed said workers um, to get them to work in the machines. And so wages started to rise. Um, basically the classic theory of tight labor market drives up the cost of, um, of labor. Um, and I, whether Marx didn't foresee that, and some people say that like Marx didn't say that like real wages wouldn't rise. I think that very clearly they did. There's a neat quote from Engels saying that um, capitalists would forever keep wages um, depressed to a famine or a starvation wage, which clearly is not the case. You can buy more than just enough food not to survive today, um, as I think the current conversation demonstrates, um, because we are not we, we do not each have one basket of tomatoes. We are <laughs> consuming more than right. is necessary to survive. Um, Leaving all that aside, I, I do think this is one of the, the very strong weaknesses of not just reading like Marxist theory, but people do this for all sorts of things. They want to read a really, really, really old text and imagine that it just applies today just because it has some sort of authoritative um, imprimatur on it because Marx was the founder. He get he knows what's right. Um, I don't think that's the correct way to approach these things. It should always be like start with the empirics and work backwards, not start with like the theoretician, start with the Bible and work forward. Um, yeah, I think that's a really good point. I, I honestly feel the same way you do about that too. Um, just to pivot really quick, are you familiar with um a VAT, sure. a value added tax? I am. What do you think about that? So um, there's two takes on it. One is that so a value added tax is basically a consumption tax, but slightly better administered. Um, so mm-hmm. obviously, if you're going to do a consumption tax, do a VAT. Don't do a sales tax. Um, right. That's the obvious first step. Um, Second, second thing that should be clear, a consumption tax is regressive. Um, so a VAT alone um, is probably bad in terms of, of, of uh, inequality, and it's probably bad in terms of like people's outcomes because um, poor people have more value for money than rich people do. So via like idea of marginal utility of money, you want more poor people to have more money. Uh, very simple economics. So it's bad there unless you're using VAT to pay for stuff that redistributes. And so that's it, it's not just a question of taxation, it's a question of what comes out of the taxation. Um, so that would be the second framing. And the third framing, um, and one that I thought was very interesting, is that there is a positive correlation between um, certain types of taxes and growth. Um, and so there is some evidence that like consumption taxation, property taxation, wealth taxation, um, and a few other types are positively correlated with growth um, because it, it seems like they encourage certain t- types of behavior that might be conducive to growth. So the, the, the simplest way to think about it is you tax consumption, therefore you reduce consumption. What do people do when they don't consume? They save. What does saving do? Drive up wealth. Um, and that has two main consequences of one, possibly increasing um, uh, accumulation, like the incentive to innovate, the incentive to accumulate more capital, and two, um, adding more wealth just might make people's lives better and therefore improve like human capital. So, um, thumbs up to VAT. Yeah, I um, I'm sure you're familiar with Medlock, right? Yeah. Yeah, I think Medlock was the one that first VAT pilled me. Um, also, too, like recognizing how these systems function, because I think most countries actually have a VAT, especially in Europe. Um, yep. So a VAT, actually, I would mu- rather, m- much rather prefer over like a sales tax because mm-hmm. sales tax is pretty regressive. Um, I can tell you right off the bat, like one of the states, I think, is it Florida that only has a sales tax but no income tax? I have no idea. You might be right, though. 
I think it is. Yeah, it is Florida. Um, that just doesn't seem like a really good way to go about funding public services, especially things like healthcare and unemployment benefits. Um, when you look at like how Florida handles that stuff, they're usually short on change. Um, so that just doesn't seem like good policy. Um, but yeah, I guess like, I guess kind of like to, <laughs> I want to go back in a circle here, but I guess mm -hmm. kind of like to your question of like, um, why do I think, or why do I not think that like, I think your second, I don't want to straw my, your second question was like, um, so your first question was like, how did I get to here? And then the mm -hmm. second question was, okay, what's stopping me from going further? I guess the only thing that's stopping me from going further, like I said, would be the practical, mm -hmm. um, implementation. And then I guess too, that like, um, I don't know, like, I don't want to say, so everything you've said makes a hundred percent sense. Right. And ah, easy. When, another like, win. <laughs> whenever, like, uh, whenever Vosh talks about these things too, it's like the same way. Um, it's just, I feel like there's people that go es essentially like, how do I want to put this? Like there's people that obviously, like you said, um, you know, want revolution tomorrow and that's, that's mm -hmm. just not going to happen. So the the implementation of like policies that you're proposing would actually be, I think in my opinion, probably really good. Um, mm -hmm. Also like in, in order for society to go forward and stuff like that. Um, I just don't know at the current moment, like especially in the US of A, mm -hmm. uh, how we can go on about that, right? Without addressing like systemic barriers, like things like the Senate or like gerrymandering and stuff like uh, that. You so know what I mean? That was, um, I think, how you began. It's like, how do we politically achieve this, right? We've got a 6-3 Supreme Court. How are we going to get this done? And so um, my answer, whenever people ask me, like, what's the most important thing? If I if I had asked the question, I'd ask Chomsky, like, what is the most important thing for leftism to, um, to, to succeed in the United States? It would literally be electoral reform. It has nothing to do with leftist policy. It has everything to do with, like, increasing the level of democracy in the United States. Um, and so, like... If you want concrete things that you could do, um, it's like the National Popular Vote Interstate Compact, or NPVIC, uh, mm -hmm. which is to try and establish a popular vote for president, which would tend to shift things towards Democrats, and it would also just be more Democratic, so I think it's good. Um, it would be things like uh, encouraging states... Um, this will sound odd, like an odd niche one, um, but it, it's to encourage states to reduce the uh, burdens required to do a referendum or um, plebiscite in their state. So a lot of states have really high like signature barriers um, and like legal barriers to get a referendum passed. If you lower that, you directly increase the amount of democracy. We've we've seen over and over and over again that direct democracy tends to produce more leftist policy outcomes than do state legislatures. Yep. Um, the, the, the anecdote that I cite um, is... Um, Oregon just decriminalized all drugs, which is incredible. Um, and Florida voted 60% for a $15 minimum wage, um, but they also voted 53% for Donald Trump. Um, so 13 points ahead, uh, three, 13 points of people voted for um, Donald Trump, but also wanted a $15 minimum wage. Um, so it, it, it's uh, electoral reform at the federal level, it's direct democracy, and it's... Um... One moment, let me get my cat. Yeah, no worries. I guess they didn't want to leave. Um, so, very cute. They are cute. The um, let's, I'm just forgetting what the third one was. Um, I want to say ah, and the third one that's an odd one is um, well, no, I'll just leave it there. So basically, my my goal is I think that we, you you need oh, it's gerrymandering, obviously. Um, it, it, it's that um. Empirically, gerrymandering gives Republicans about a 4.4 uh, percentage point advantage in the House. So Republicans have a huge advantage in the, in the Senate. Unfortunately, you really can't change that. The best thing to do there is to push for like Puerto Rico and um, DC to become states, um, stuff like that. But um, again, those are like long-term things. Um, and um, the, the House has like a 4.4% advantage for Republicans. Democrats need to win, on average, uh, in the popular vote, a 54.4% um, just to win a one-seat majority in the House. So they are, we're at like a significant disadvantage. And just even Democrats. It's not even like leftists. So um, I feel I, like yeah. that's, that, um, that's, such, that's such an important point that you bring up because, again, I feel like the, the, um, the majority of the like anti-electoralism takes are really just kind of like so poisoning the well like right from the start that like we're kind of arguing from um we're we're, we're like handicapping ourselves or shooting ourselves in the foot from the get-go um 
I don't know, like, I feel like the arguments that were made of like, oh, like, we shouldn't vote for Biden or whatever, mm -hmm. because him and Trump are the same was like really ridiculous. And like anyone that argued that was should probably never be taken seriously again. Um, but I feel like, again, like, like I said, like the biggest obstacle, I think, to, to implementation of any policy like that, even like basic, like, like lib shit, right? Like, mm -hmm. <laughs> like it, it, expanding Obamacare to a public option or whatever. Um, or even like even on climate change, like I don't know, like at this point, I don't even know if like a cap and trade would even be something that would be considered. Probably yeah. because Republicans would oppose that. Um, but even if like we were able to get that done, it would have to be through <laughs> some sort of like uh, electoral reform, right? Like the system we have obviously doesn't work when like 15 states have more senators than California, which has mm -hmm. the same population. Um, the Democrats are obviously and the left is obviously at a disadvantage from the get go. I've always said that too. Like that's that's something that I I totally agree with you on because um the way that the system is set up it does definitely a hundred percent benefit Republicans more than Democrats and conservatives. I know that um, I guess if there were one last thing that I think that you could try to push for, which sounds like an odd one, would be enormously increasing the funding for pop, um, public radio and public broadcasting. There was this really neat study that I read recently, which I think I can pull up, which showed that there is a direct correlation between number of public broadcasters in a given European country and the weakness of said country's far right party. Um, now, obviously, we can't prove that that's causal, right? It might be that countries that were further to the left had more funding for public radio, and as a result, they have weaker far right parties. But we also have a lot of other types of evidence. We know that Fox News shifts people to the right. We know that NPR and PBS are the most trusted in, in uh, sources of news in the United States. We know public media is most trusted um, in, in every country on Earth. The BBC is the most trusted of, of British news sources uh, and so on. Yeah. Um, Basically, I I think that the way I think about this is I really like a Michael Brooks quote on this one. It's that if we're playing a game, if this is chess, our goal is either to add more pieces to our side or take their pieces off the board. One of the pieces that consistently moves people to the right um, is a large chunk of like the fake news media, as it were, like the actual fake news media, like Fox and OANN and so on, um, that just promulgate the, the dumbest shit. <laughs> Yeah, uh, 100%. at the beginning you were talking about how people got indoctrinated into like race realism and fundamentalism and so on like yeah and that's why they vote republican <laughs> yeah to, especially too like um i feel like a lot of republicans who vote they don't vote based on their like material conditions um they vote like out of spite um for things like um obviously for things like racism or mm -hmm. like uh you know like i i so my dad um has a hair salon. So I'm like very accustomed to like hearing a lot of Republicans come in and talk. And the one thing that they'll always bring up is like, oh, like I don't mind Biden, but that Kamala woman, like I don't want her mm -hmm. to get to get anywhere near the presidency. And I'm like, well, why? I'm like, what's so bad about Kamala? And it's obviously that she's black. Like, yeah, they, it's a, they, she's a she and she's black. Yeah. Yeah. Uh. Like they never actually bring up any like policy substance or like whatever. They're just like, oh, like I'm afraid that like if Kamala's in charge, then like Black Lives Matter. And like all these black people are gonna have too much power in society. Like it's crazy no, I, to me that it's crazy to me that people will just put their like material interests and like um, the uh, the harm like being done to them by like Republicans with like passing things like tax cuts and deregulation um, just all for like oh because I don't like Black Lives Matter. There was a um, there's two really neat articles on this actually. One is one from. Um... Uh, Matt Deglacius at Vox, um, which is called The Great Awakening, <laughs> um, which I, it sounds like a meme, um, and it is a little bit of a meme. Um, in short, I, I, it just shows um, how white liberals in particular have moved really far left on race issues over the past, since 2014 or so. And so part of what's in, so interesting to me is if we were having this conversation in 2013, we'd be having a very different conversation, um, assuming that we are, in by the definitions of this study, we are both white liberals. Um, yeah. I, um, so that's been that's a really interesting dynamic. So for one, there's been this really interesting recent, recent like six year old recent um, shift in in racial politics in the United States. And the second is this one. Um, I want to say, Ember Race uh, Welfare. There was this really neat study. Um, yeah, I think it's this one. Yeah, it's this one, which showed that. Um, 
empirically, um, there is reason to believe that like part of the reason the United States has a less social democratic um, state than other countries is because of racial animosity. Um, so you, you know that like Ben Shapiro talking point or Turning Points USA talking point that Sweden has welfare because they're homogenous. It's true, yeah. but not for the reason they're saying. Sweden has more welfare because it's homogenous. And so the racists don't hate the poor people. <laughs> But in America, yeah. they do hate the poor people. And so the racists vote Republican. It's as simple as that to some degree. Um, yeah, and, and you know, too, when they say homogenous, they don't mean like uncultural or like ethnic background. It's they race. Mean on, it's, it's always race. race. Yeah. yeah, of course. Because like, it, like, I don't know how they don't realize it. I think they're just lying or they're just stupid. But if you go to Europe, like especially like where my parents are from, Greece, like two, like if you take one Greek from like the, the Mediterranean South, and one from like the the northern mountains they are totally fucking different okay like mm -hmm. the the greek from the south will have a totally different dialect um they'll also have a different complexion because of how close they are to the sun mm -hmm. and stuff like that um the people in the north will have a different dialect they'll have different cultural practices different religious practices like mm -hmm. this whole like oh europe is so homogenous like europe is for the white people shit is so dumb like i i would implore any of these like white, white uh white no um race realist or like even like ben shapiro which is kind of funny how they bring this shit up as like some sort of like oh we can't do social democracy here because we don't have all white people like basically yeah like that's that that was always funny to me like as somebody no, I, of european descent like i i've been to europe so many times and like this homogenous shit is like not the case like well and it's one of the things that's that that really um you know how there's like the whole, uh, it's called cultural Marxism as like a meme. Um, so the, the cultural Marxist theory, the, the critical, the, um, critical theory, like the Frankfurt School and the mm -hmm. Althusser um, all, uh, are, are, are like the writers on this. And they all argue basically that like the culture of voters is in part why, um, uh, why people who are poor don't vote for like socialism. They don't vote for leftism. And so um, the theory is like, why do people vote for race, for like right-wing parties economically that don't benefit them personally, it's because they benefit them in terms of racism. They benefit them in terms of like sexism. They vote benefit them in terms of various bigotries. Um, and also they argue that there's a culture of capitalism that comes along with that. So because you're coming to the Republican party, because of these affiliations, you also adopt like the, the, the praise for the free market just because you're in that party as part of like the, the cultural um, acclimation into the Republican party. And so um, to me, this suggests like people like to hate on like class reductionists, Sure, I'll hate on class reductionists here too. Um, one of the, the, the things that's so useful about reducing racism in the United States is it makes people stop voting for Republicans just because they hate black people. Um, yeah. It makes them vote for Republicans because they hate poor people, which is a much better reason. Yeah, no, I, I don't, I like, I 100% agree with you. I feel like too, um, I wanted to ask you because I, I feel like mm -hmm. other socialists that I've had this conversation with think mm -hmm. that like the start and end of racism begins and ends with capitalism. That like, mm -hmm. if only... We abolish capitalism then we'll end systemic racism we'll end like racism like cultural racism um i don't think that's the case and i don't think racism started when capitalism started but yeah. i've heard this point like brought up hundreds of times when i've had discussions with people that are to the left of me and that's um, a very class reductionist view it's that like race racism stems from material conditions like oh right. the, the blacks yeah. are poor and the whites are rich the whites adopt racism to hate on the black sort of thing and it just doesn't seem to be the case like a lot of these bigotries are thousands or millions of years old um <laughs> yeah that like that's yeah that's exactly like what <laughs> what i would say too it's like i don't think abolishing capitalism is gonna end you know the hatred that a lot of people especially a lot of white people in this country that vote republican have racial animosity for like black people and you know native american people and um simply even like the shit that trump's doing right with like the mm -hmm. china virus like that's that's deep rooted where he says like oh covid is the china virus like that's obviously like deep rooted in like racial animosity and racial yeah. like racial agitation like he's not doing that because i don't know like <laughs> he like cares about like where the virus actually came from or whatever like he's just doing that because he knows who he's appealing to like he's beating the drum no i agree um yeah no i fundamentally agree so yeah, and, al and also too like i feel like oh no sorry i was just after you up, like, no finish up okay i just wanted to bring up that like even under even even if we had a system where like let's say that like the workers did have um, the control of the means of production, right? And that the workers were able to democratically vote on like, hey, how should we uh, divvy up? Or how should we, uh, you know, um, uh, give out dividends? Or what should we do with our surplus, stuff like that? Like, mm -hmm. let's, say you, let's say you have like one corporation or like one, one firm in like the South or whatever, right? And it's like majority 
um, majority white people or whatever, and there's some black people, there's some minority groups. Mm -hmm. What if they get together and they vote and they're like, well, fuck the black people. We're just, we, we just want a white only firm. Like we don't want black people in here. Like that's it. Like get out of here. Like we're not going to give you shit. Like, I guess that'd be, a, that, that would also be like my problem too, with like fully switching over to like some sort of like socialism system going forward. Obviously not now. Well, I think that, so to me, those are failures of very decentralized economic systems, whether it be something like anarcho-capitalism or like anarcho-communism, libertarian socialism, because you're yeah. saying everything should be the decision of the firm uh, without recognizing that, hey, sometimes firms make really, really bad decisions. And in this case, it would be a decision based on race. Um, and so um, I, d I do agree this is a significant problem. I would just say that... Um, this to me is like a very simple argument for why you want like federal government structures of some kind. You just need like some central authority to be able to impose some rules on all of the firms. Like, hey, stop firing all the black people sort of things. Um, so I, that would be my argument there. So I guess. Yeah. Uh, yeah. Sorry. No, no. I just want to say, yeah, <laughs> I, get, I, get, I get where you're coming from. So um, if I had to. So. The first, the first thing was transition to socialism. If you had to pick one more thing you want to talk about, um, maybe about like leftist policy, it could be like a Stockton policy you quite like, or a question about socialist policy. What would be the last policy? This stream. Oof. Let's see. Um, honestly, I feel like I feel like one of the more interesting topics um, that sometimes I feel like lefties, not even mm -hmm. I would I, like. The term lefty or like left wing is so is so weird, right? Because if you're mm -hmm. talking about in terms of like left wing online, well, we're talking about like okay, like um, full on like communist or socialist. But mm -hmm. if we're talking like, because I know people like fucking in real like, life, left wing means AOC. Yeah, but I, I know that like even people like Kyle Kalinske or Jimmy Dore say they're like lefties, even though they're mm -hmm. not. They're not like anti capitalism. But regardless, like one thing I wanted to to quickly gloss um, over with you on is about like foreign policy stuff because i feel mm -hmm. like i remember i remember chomsky talking about how um and i don't know if you remember this but i remember chomsky talking about how like actually pulling out troops out of syria where we were protecting kurdish populations is actually a bad idea mm -hmm. and there was a lot of people on the left that were like shitting on chomsky for that and we're like oh look at chomsky he's a fucking sellout he's an imperialist like mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. <laughs> so that was that was funny to me it was because like it just i, I feel like Oh, no, go ahead. I, I, I don't want to ramble. Go ahead. No, uh, you're fine. I, my, my basic take is I quite like the, the, the term that some people are more anti-liberal or anti-America than they are pro-socialism or pro-internationalism. like And so sometimes you'll get people who are supporting Assad not because they genuinely believe in the policies of Bashar al-Assad. They, they don't know or care about what his policies are. If you ask them what he believes, they can't tell you. Um, instead, they are anti-America. They just oppose it because America does it. And I can get I can get hating America. I totally understand that. But like mm -hmm. epistemically, that is not a good reason to oppose something. Um, similarly, like just hating on liberals. And again, I can understand frustration with liberals or like people in the center or whatever. Just hating um, people because they're liberals rather than hating them because you have like a socialist vision of what's better to do than the liberals. Um, I, basically, I think that that's, again, just very, very poor epistemology. So I think that's pretty common. One of the reasons that I found... Um, in, in like Kurd, in, in the Kurds, for example, it's basically just opposing America because America is doing it rather than opposing um, like why America supporting a like left wing movement in the Middle East is probably a good thing. Even if America is doing it for like shitty geopolitical reasons, you should be happy that those shitty geopolitical reasons align with like a small leftist anarcho syndicalist or like libertarian socialist commune um, structure gets to rise up. Uh, and so people are, I, I think that they're just doing this sort of knee-jerk reaction. And this isn't just a leftist thing. This is like a how humans work sort of thing. People think in terms of tribes, like I'm a leftist, therefore I hate the liberals sort of thing. Um, I, I am the in-group, I hate the out-group. Um, so I, I don't, I don't generally, I, so I think that a whole lot of, of U.S. foreign policy is incredibly bad. I do think that sometimes U.S. foreign policy can lead to good outcomes, but usually those good outcomes, I would say, are incidental to U.S. foreign policy rather than um, necessarily goals of U.S. foreign policy. So for example, I would say that um, the promotion of democracy in Iraq and Afghanistan is a good thing. Um, it didn't, it wasn't the goal of the U.S. to in, like invade these countries. That goal was basically to maintain like regional power. Um, 
um, to box in Iran, to uh, get rid of regional threats. And they, they impose democracy in part because they think that democracy will lead to stability and they think democracy will lead to economic growth. So they're not doing democracy because they really, really want the Iraqi people to have a choice in who leads them. They're doing it for strategic security concerns. Um, and so I, the, the analogy would be like, um, I don't know, it, it, it's, it's like, uh, it would be like Britain fighting Germany, right? Like two imperialist yeah. powers, one of which is obviously like on a, a scale of order, worse magnitude, like industrial slaughter is a little bit worse, just a little bit, than is like non-industrialized slaughter like Britain does. Britain opposing Germany, Britain was on the right side, but not necessarily for all the right reasons. It was opposing Germany because Germany was a threat, not because they were like, oh, we really, really hate the fascists, right? Winston Churchill, right. noted racist. <laughs> like, yeah, I, yeah. Like, that, like uh, that's my the, star the starvation in India and in, uh, Bengal, like, <laughs> killed like a billion people so um yes no yeah i don't i actually sent you something on discord i don't know if you i don't know if you've seen this um assad talking about neo <laughs> neoliberalism and he's like he's like saying the problem it's really funny yeah oh, you you've seen it right mm -hmm. <laughs> I, I believe doesn't he mention that there's marijuana in bread and that's one of the things that neoliberalism caused it's like incredibly stupid so it's gay marriage um it's transgenderism so there's an ism at the end and mm -hmm. then, um, yeah, there's like, also, I guess he, I think he says like the degener, the degenerate, uh, degeneration of our culture. So mm -hmm. obviously he's like pretty fashy shit. Um, but no, yeah, it's just funny to me that there is some people and obviously there is a term for these people, but I don't want to be derogatory, like tankies, but there's mm -hmm. people on the left that like, will, will nonstop like defend China and like North Korea to like, <laughs> to like till the day they die but they're like oh the u.s is bad well it's like yeah. yeah of course like we can we can like we can weigh these things out right so like of course like the u.s has some pretty bad fucked up foreign policy decisions that we made over the last 50 years um but that just to excuse like china or any of these other countries is like being like no actually like this is all cia propaganda like it's just funny to me like i don't know no, I, it's very frustrating. I think that it's fundamentally to me, it's bad epistemology. And if there's the, if there's one thing that I value more highly than like socialism or any of my political goals, it's like the, the attempt to encourage people to find good ways of finding truth. Um, I really like the term morally lucky, actually. I forget who coined it. I want to say I got it from Destiny. So uh, I guess I'm a neoliberal shill. But the term morally lucky is like you, you got the correct morality or politically lucky. You got the correct politics, as I think, but you didn't get it for good reasons. You like got into it for, and I, not to demean, you but you got it because like you watched the right streamer and this gave you the correct politics and you never questioned their beliefs right you didn't do any introspection you didn't do any reading you didn't read the sources you didn't do anything and instead you just totally followed someone's worldview that basically makes you lucky you could have watched someone else and gotten a totally different worldview um and so i again that's not like a, trying to be a critique on you it's more just um this is something a lot of people do literally all humans in fact they consume media and they change their views to reflect what they see in media and so the, the, the number one goal is like skepticism and actually trying to read sources in depth and not just trusting um what people yeah, I tell think, you i think i think one thing i try to do as well is i always try to like form a counter to like whatever position i hold mm -hmm. um so that i'm i'm actually better able to argue it um so that's like one thing i try to do with myself too this is like again this is like the like you brought up an example but this is also like kind of like something destiny does right like when he has when he had those debates with um, the no BS guy about like incest and stuff mm -hmm. and, De and Destiny was asking him like, okay, so why is incest bad? And then he was like, okay, it's bad because it's bad. <laughs> like that's not an yeah. argument, but, but regardless, mm -hmm. like, yeah, I think you're hundred percent correct. Um, also, I just wanted to say there's, there's some pretty heavy Malders in your chat. I was, I, I don't know if you've seen me smirking, but there's some, I there's I saw you typing in chat. It's pretty funny. I, I, at, any, at any given time, I've said this before, my community is something like, I want to say 60%, maybe 40% Dem Socks, 20% Sock Dems, like 15% Tankies, 15% Libertarian Socials, 10% Other. Um, and so it, there's, I, it is never like a peaceful, non-fighting space, which I actually think is a good thing. I think that encourages good epistemology because people are constantly being questioned in their beliefs. So I'm really happy that there's some Mulders in my chat. Um, I, I, yeah, I was actually very confused. So the one guy, Paul Cortez, was like simultaneously arguing that like socialism is bad, but also capitalism is bad. So I don't know what's going on with that guy. And then legendary true third duck. positionism. Well, <laughs> and then legendary duck is out here talking about like, uh, uh, wait, no, that was the other guy. He said, "Oh, the Hitler Stalin lines. Haha, go choke on some CIA <laughs> cock." It's pretty funny. Um, yeah. And with uh, with the note of choking on CIA cock. Um, 
we've hit around maybe an hour and 10 minutes. This seems like a reasonable good place to start wrapping up a bit. Yeah, um, of course. No, no. I don't I don't want to tie your hands up. This is um this is awesome. I'm I'm really like I'm really glad um um I'm really glad that um you let me do this. Sure. I'm really like I'm I'm really appreciative of it. Um I know especially for like starting out and like small content creators and stuff like mm -hmm. it's always like it's always like oh like you know like even though like um you're not as big as like destiny or Vosh, it's still like to me it's like wow holy shit like socked on left like it's pretty fucking he's pretty fucking big like well thank you that's kind uh yeah, to be to be totally fair right like it's it's it is literally and this is not a meme like three fifths or four fifths of my subscribers on youtube are from like the memes so just th think of me as like a six thousand subscriber person or something along those lines um, i love the memes though the memes are actually pretty like s tier memes they're pretty good well what can i say s tier ideology s tier memes um so what if you had like one closing takeaway um what would it be like what would be how, how would i do this what do you think the the strongest um we didn't argue too strongly so i can't fa entirely yeah. fairly ask this but coming away from this conversation what do you think you personally uh strongest argument for like a socialist position versus a social democratic position is strongest argument for socialism and then strongest argument for social democracy as a closer yeah sure so let me just um and i'm sorry to put you on the spot <laughs> No, no, I just like, I just, um, I just always write things down. So I see them out front, um, strongest position for socialism and then for social democracy. Okay. Mm -hmm. Um, yeah. So basically I think my strongest position for social democracy would be that going forward right now, that would be the, the, the most practical and the easiest to implement, especially in the USA, which is a pretty, <laughs> which is a pretty dystopian country mm -hmm. in comparison to our European counterparts and even places like Canada, um, Australia, uh, New Zealand, um, I think I think pushing for something like social democracy would be much easier at this moment than than going for socialism. But I think the description the descriptions you brought up and the implementations you brought up of actually we don't need to do like a full workers revolution tomorrow. We mm -hmm. can actually work on things like um, like you said you brought up the um, the Meitner plan or the social when uh, social wealth fund proposal, mm -hmm. um, which. I wanted to ask you too, the social wealth fund proposal, that's kind of like a nationalization, right? A nationalization process? Basically, yes. Uh, it can have higher or lower. Yes, yes, yes. Okay, okay, yeah. So that's, um, so yeah, uh, I wouldn't be opposed to that either. Um, I think too, so that was, that's like my, um, on my position for social democracy, like I think it's the most practical mm -hmm. um, and, and it's something we can get done now, right? Mm -hmm. Like. We don't have to wait 20, 40 years, or we don't have to wait until every other country is a socialist country. Because mm -hmm. I've had this argument with other socialists as well. Um, we're like, okay, like if we move to socialism overnight, like if the US, I don't know how you feel about this, but if the US mm -hmm. simply um, moved to socialism overnight, I think we would be at a massive disadvantage with other countries that still operate under capitalism. Oh, as a, as a question. Um, oh, I, yeah, I, I was just saying, yeah. Sure. I mean, so I think that one of the reasons I'm a reformist is I think that uh, even let's say that you're revolutionary and you think you're going to do some revolution in the third world, I think that the United States is just going to crush you. I think any individual country in the first world that's going to even possibly reform into socialism, it's going to be ostracized yeah. and face like a whole lot of rejection. So I do basically agree with this idea of, um, in particular, I would like to reform the United States or ideally the EU, but I live in the United States, so I'm working here. Um, to be a like sock dam power and push the rest of the world sock dam so that when it goes further left it faces less resistance so i very much am in, in alignment with that yeah yeah that's not that's actually a very good idea i would i would agree with that as well um and then i think too um second point right you said my strongest position for socialism sure i think the strongest position for socialism i could make was exactly the points you brought up mm -hmm. which <laughs> Easy. And, and I and I know some of the 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 chatters and chat are going to be molding. Um, but this is like a form of incrementalism, right? Like we're mm -hmm. not transitioning overnight to um to a dictatorship of the proletariat. We're not transitioning overnight to like putting the the means of production in the hands of the workers, right? Like we're not going to oh. execute mm -hmm. landlords in the streets. Um, we're gonna have to we're gonna have to do these things. Um, obviously through an electoral system, mm -hmm. right? And I think. The things you brought up like the minor plan 
worker co-ops, um, the social wealth fund proposal, um, mm -hmm. thing, and even other stuff we talked about, right, which doesn't even really have much to do with socialism, but like a VAT or mm -hmm. even like expanding um, marginal tax rates, which is something that I think a lot more. Um, I think AOC talks about this quite a bit, but I think we need a lot more progressives and even socialists to talk about like taxes, taxes, taxes. I think taxes is, is an important part of our society, especially in the U.S., where mm -hmm. we did once have high tax rates marginal tax rates of like 91 percent right on people i think at that time making over like two million dollars um so that's like one thing we should be talking about but other than that like i i think my strongest position for socialism would be um doing things like worker co-ops mm -hmm. um essentially and i don't want to be, be like an npc but essentially the points you brought up right like um the well, glad we plan. agree fellow citizen <laughs> beaming my thoughts yeah, into yeah. yours okay yeah yeah like i i think um i think i've always especially when i started getting more into like leftist thought and leftist um not theory into like leftist um ide ideology i think i've always kind of been like in the center between social democracy and socialism obviously in a perfect and just society the center mm -hmm. would be between stalin and kropotkin but that's <laughs> not <laughs> <laughs> there, there's this one quote by I want to say it's a French leader during the the seven the seventeen nineties revolution there where he's like I would like to see a society that is sufficiently far left that I would be guillotined for being too far right something along those <laughs> lines so yeah no I get that yeah no a hundred percent um and also sorry uh ten thousand years says uh this guy was conservative yesterday what the fuck does he know about socialism well I wasn't conservative yesterday if I was conservative yesterday. Um, I would be a dumb fuck, and I'm not a dumb fuck, so yeah. Well, thank you very much for coming on um, Not a Dumb Fuck. Uh, to me, the summary of your positions, uh, if, if, and you can tell me if I'm unfair, is it sounds like, for pragmatic reasons, you focus on sock dem policies, or what I would call left liberal or sock dem policies, um, mm -hmm. and ideally, you might want something that's more left of that. And so in short, could you summarize your position as sock dem in the streets, <laughs> dem sock in the sheets? Oh, yeah, you're, yeah, the med, yeah, the med uh, the sock dem... Sock them in the streets, market socialist in the sheets. Yeah, I, I, I guess, yeah. Okay. I guess, I guess if we're going to characterize me that way, yeah, we could do that. Well, happy to uh, continue pushing you back under the sheets, as it were. More and more Mark Sock. Um, with that, uh, let's do the shill at the end. So tell us who you are, um, tell us what you do, and where people can find you. Sure. My name is Nico Sam. I make videos on YouTube. Um, I'm trying to make more and more content. Um, but obviously, I'm 20 years old, and I like to fuck around and uh, play video games and do schoolwork. Mm -hmm. So when, when I'm not doing that, I'll be posting videos to my YouTube channel. Um, you can follow me on YouTube, and I think Sucked on Left has the links uh, mm -hmm. on YouTube and Twitter. Um, f f uh, bonus me, my other Twitter, which had close to like 150 followers, got taken down because I posted clips from the Tim Pool Destiny debate. <laughs> Um, so I had to create a new Twitter. So that's why I have 16 followers. Tragic. Well, <laughs> be sure to give this man a follow. I guess I don't actually know your gender. Be sure to give this person a follow and uh, consider subscribing to them on YouTube. Thanks again for coming on. Thank you, man. I really appreciate it. I hope you have a great night, okay? Sure. And okay. I hope you don't mind me pulling you left over and over again, okay? Tug, tug. I'm, I'm sure we'll have more discussions going forward, you know? Well, thank you very much. Have a nice evening. Love you, buddy. Love you too.